be the change that God wants you to be in the world. Guys, you ever, you ever realize that you just got to live for something bigger than yourself? I mean, you just, you just got to do it. I mean, the world is full of people who just live for themselves. God intended us to live for something much bigger than ourselves. God didn't want us to make excuses. He built us to make history. So stop making excuses. <clears throat> Doing a little different thing today. We're going to take a little detour from Romans for a very special day. We've got someone in our, in our midst who we're going to be ordaining as a minister today to the pastor, Ron Hetrick. And uh, so we're going to spend this time worshiping God together and getting ready to ordain Ron. If you've never been a part of this, it's going to be something special for you. It really will. But uh, so that call thing we talked about there, you realize every... Everybody is called by God. Not everybody's called to be a preacher. And I've heard some preachers that I thought shouldn't have been called to be a preacher. <laughs> you know, maybe, I don't know, I'm just joking. No, I'm not. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, uh, everybody has a calling. God has placed a calling. And listen, many of you know, and, and if you're my former band students in here, please don't, please don't change this, okay? But most of you know that, that I felt like I was called to the ministry before I went to high school. But I didn't think I was called to preach or didn't think I was called to be a music minister or a youth minister. I thought I was called to be a band director. And that was my mission field. That was my ministry. I approached it as that. Sometimes I threw a chair. Sometimes I threw a stick. Sometimes I threw people. You know, but you got to do that. You know, that's just theatrics for band directors. Just case, just case, Susie, Mark, y'all wonder that. Just, that's just theatrics. You know, yeah. But, uh, but seriously, and a lot of people say, well, you know, which did you like better? I taught this last week. Which did you like better? You know, being a band director or being, a, you know, full time pastor. And the thing is, I like them both because God put me in both places, and God used to be in both places. Uh, so. Understand that wherever you are, that is your ministry. Yeah, if God puts you in Duke Power, Duke Power is just paying you to be a missionary to Duke Power. If He puts you in the school, He did that you know, to be a missionary there. He's put you wherever He puts you for a specific purpose. And God has called some of us to be pastors. I, I'm going to tell you, I've thought this call for a long time. I didn't see myself as a pastor. I didn't, uh-uh. I wasn't interested in this. Yeah, I, 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 she didn't want to be no pastor's wife. She didn't want to be no pastor's wife. So, you know. Okay. Better move on. Woo! How about that weather we're having? I'm just saying. Speaking of the weather, you know, we, next week we're going to have a series on how to, how to build an ark. And uh, I'm make sure we understand that. Um, but so, all right, where's Ron? Ron's hiding in the back back there. Ron, so you want to be a preacher, huh? I guess. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure now. I can't, I can't talk you out of this thing. Uh, that's one of the things, every time I do premarital counseling, I do four or five sessions with folks, and from the very first one all the way till right before the, the wedding, I'll say, you sure you still want to get married? I can't talk you out of this, right? You know, only one person said, "Please talk me out of it." <laughs> uh, but so, how do you end up? How do you end up wanting to be a pastor? Okay, now, did Ron just all of a sudden, you know, eat pizza one day and think, "Hmm, I think I want to be a pastor." You know, being a pastor is is something that, quite frankly, now I know people who said, "Well, I knew I was going to be this, that, and the other from the time I was a kid." But to be honest with you. It's not like when, when those of us were Ronnie and all of us used to play army out in, around Bellevue School, you know, it wasn't all of a sudden that I thought, hey, I want to be a preacher one day. No, I want to be a fireman or a policeman, you know, one of them things. Now, now people want to be like, you know, Steve Jobs or something like that, but whatever. But so being a pastor is not one of those things where you're out on the playground and you say, oh, when I grow up, I want to be a pastor. 
You know, no, you don't do that. And it's, it's also not, and, and please hear me on this, because some people do this. It's not one of those things that when you can't figure out what you want to do, you go be a pastor. Amen. The world is full of people like that right now, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. It's not something you pick off the job board. It's not something you, you do just to fill time. No. No. And, and trust me, listen. Ron, you don't, you don't pick being a pastor because it's going to be fun. <laughs> be a pastor, they said. It'll be fun, they said. <laughs> you know? Oh, mercy. Okay, it is fun following God, but it, sometimes it feels that way. Sometimes you feel like you just, you just can't win. Here's the thing I want to understand, it, all, all joking aside. Being a pastor is the highest calling that God puts on anybody. The highest calling God. Now, everybody's called. But being a pastor is the highest calling God puts on anybody. It is a supernatural calling. Okay. Now, think about this. It's not your your it's not your church that calls you. It's not another friend that calls you. It is God the Father, God the Creator of the universe, God the Sovereign King that calls you and Ron that chooses you to be a minister. That's who calls you. It's the highest privilege in the world. Because, and here's the thing, because you have been called and chosen to be a minister by none other than God Himself. Okay. And the pastor has a special calling from God and a special gift from God that's been given that, that pastor, that gift, in order for him or her to do the work of the ministry. Okay? In John 15, 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And listen to what he says here. He says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen and ordained you. That's what we're going to be doing today, is we're going to be ordaining Ron. But guess what? It's not us that's doing that. God chose Ron and ordained Ron. We are just, we are just corporately acknowledging God's ordination for him. Okay. And that word ordained there really means appoint, I appointed you or I set you apart for a special service, uh, a special work. And, and I think about this, when I think about this, God's words to Jeremiah just comes so vividly to my mind. And there really is not a more powerful or personal or, or um, challenging statement that God has ever made to anybody. Listen to what he says. Jeremiah 1.5 Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. God is saying before anything, I had already picked Jeremiah and ordained him and set him apart to be a prophet to the nations. Think about that, Ron. Before you were ever a twinkle in your daddy's eye or a bump on your mommy's belly, God knew you. And God had already called you. God had already planned this. But that's not all. God had set you apart for a very specific and special calling. God ordains you to be His spokesperson. Guys, that's just supernatural. There, like I said, you can't equate this to, to any particular thing like a job or anything like that. It's not a job. It's a supernatural calling. And God calls people to be a specific leader of a specific ministry for Him. But Ron, you're not only called, but you're sent. Okay, You're not only called to be the pastor, but you're sent by God. You're called by God, but you are sent by God for a specific purpose. And in John, first, uh, the first chapter of John, we look at about John's calling and his sending. Look at this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. Ron, you can put your name in there. Okay? There was a man sent from God whose name was Ron. And you can, you can take that to the bank. Okay? You're on, you are a man sent from God 
God calls particular people to a particular role for a particular purpose. And Ron, that's you. That's who you are. That's what God has done. So Ron, you need to see yourself and, and we need to see uh, pastors as the sent leader. So the question is, who sends you? Well, here's the answer. The Holy Spirit is the one who sends people. Okay? The Holy Spirit sends people to do the ministry, and when the church body recognizes that sending and releases that person to do that ministry, that's when God is displayed in all of His magnificence through the church body out into the world. So, Ron, as you, as you step into this and, and, and begin to fulfill these roles, the real work of God will be and has been accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's not what you can do in your own power. It's not what you can do uh, through, you know, it's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit and your submission to follow what the Holy Spirit says to do. All right. So, the Holy Spirit, Ron, has called you to be His instrument, His channel, His, his uh, porthole, if you will, His portal. And He wants to use you, your body, your life, your gifts, your talents, everything to show people how to bring glory to God through your life. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The Holy Spirit wants to conform you to the image of Christ and wants to transform you by the renewing of your mind. And the Holy Spirit wants you to use, wants to use you to preach the gospel, to teach people, but more importantly, to live the gospel. To live the gospel. But there's something important here that we all need to understand. That verse at the end. He was not the light, but He was sent to bear witness to the light. Too many times we get that upside down. We think we're the light. And we want that light to shine on us a whole lot. And we put people all around. It's going to be very tempting to put people all around you who are going to tell you how great you are. It's going to be tempting to put people all around you who are going to tell you exactly what you want to hear, not what you need to hear. Fight that temptation. Because it's going to be that way. You are not the light. You are, you are the one who points people toward the light. Louis Giglio always says, God's name is I am and your name is I am not. And just remember that. Don't ever get that out of order. Don't ever get that out of order. But here's the thing. We've got to be honest about this. Ron, and, and no minister, no pastor ever achieves their calling. They receive their calling. It's not something you do, not something you work at and get real good at. And all of a sudden, you, you know, you get it. Mm -mm. There's a huge difference in that. This calling is not achieved, it's received. And so the important thing is this, is we don't have a ministry. This is not Scott's church. This is not Scott's church. This is not Scott's ministry. This is God's church and God's ministry. The church is the bride of Christ. Too many people turn it into a prostitute of a man. Amen. This is the bride of Christ. And we're to love this church. We're to cherish this church. It's not your ministry. It's not my ministry. It's God's ministry given to and through us. Okay. Because we're stewards. We're, we're ambassadors. Okay. Uh, our ministry of Christ is, is of, through, for, and to Christ. Okay. By the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, you represent God. And you're sent by the Holy Spirit to be God's ambassador. 2 Corinthians 5.20. One of my favorite verses. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though, we were as though He, God, were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Run as a pastor. You are sent as God's ambassador. Okay? He's given you the ministry of delivering that message of reconciliation to the world, and we're His ambassador. Think about that in a political sense. Like, let's say the ambassador to uh, the U U.S. ambassador to uh, 
Great Britain or whatever. Okay? That person is sent and chosen and ordained, so to speak, by the president to be the official voice of the presidency to England. Okay. And that's what we are. We're ambassadors. We are chosen to represent the sender and to speak to the for the sender. And for us, the sender is God Almighty. It's not the president. It's not the Congress. You know. And here's the thing. As an ambassador, you belong to, to whoever sent you. My nephew married a, a gentleman who is, is the ambassador to the UN from a, from a country, a Middle Eastern country, Palestine to be exact. And he will tell you, I speak for Palestine. And when he speaks in the UN assembly, people are listening to the Palestinian voice. He, he represents powerfully his country. Okay? And that's who we, and guys, we just, that's who we are as ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Christ. It's not just preachers are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. You are an ambassador for Christ. Say to yourself, I say it out loud, I am an ambassador for Christ. I am an ambassador for Christ. I speak for Christ. I speak for Christ. I represent Christ in everything I do. I represent Christ in everything I do. Because we exist, we are commissioned by God and sent to the world to be His representatives, to be His ambassador. We exist solely for the purpose to do that. And here's the important thing. We possess all the power and authority of God Himself through the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that the same power, Jesus is the power that, that empowered Jesus' birth, His life, His crucifixion, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, all are in you and available to you right now. Amen. That's the power that you work from, people. That's right. Stop living a powerless life. Stop living a, a defeated life. God came and gave the Holy Spirit to you. Jesus died and sent the Holy Spirit to you so you can live a victorious Christian life. Stop living a defeated life because Satan laughs all the way to the back. Look at them silly Christians. <laughs> they whine and they moan it all the way. You know, he's loving it. He's loving it. And here's the important thing. The message that we as ambassadors of Jesus Christ deliver is not our message. It's the message of our King. When it becomes our message, guess what? We forfeit our ambassadorship. So Ron, you're the sent leader, but also you're the spiritual leader. You're called to be the spiritual leader in, in a church, in this church. You're called to be a man that's mature in his faith, a man that's respected and esteemed because you have that high calling of pastor. Uh, J. Oswald Sanders, great, uh, great uh, writer and pastor, says this, Spiritual leaders are not elected, appointed, or created by the synods or the church assemblies. God alone makes them. In his book, uh, Henry Blackaby, has a book called Spiritual Leadership. And he basically lays out five different uh, characteristics of a spiritual leader. I'll give them to you right quick. He says, first of all, the spiritual leader's task is to move people from where they are to where God wants them to be. That's influence. You know? once, once a spiritual leader understands where God wants to take somebody then they make every effort to move their followers from following their own agenda, our own agenda, to pursuing God's agenda. Listen, if you think you're leading and you turn around and ain't nobody behind you, you're just out taking a walk. <laughs> Listen, people who fail... Leaders who fail to move people to God's agenda have not led anybody. You might have manipulated, sweet talked, bullied, pressured, pleaded with somebody, but you have not led anybody anywhere until the people have adjusted their lives to the will of God. 
So second, Henry Blackman says, spiritual leaders depend on the Holy Spirit. Folks, I cannot impress upon you the importance of understanding the Holy Spirit's work in your life. As a believer, you were indwelled the moment you became what God can do. So if you think you're doing it, you're deceiving yourself. And who is the great deceiver? So, oh, golly, we've got to say that better now. Let's try that again. And who is the great deceiver? Thanks. Thank you. God's calling you to do something that only you can do. Ron, and all of us in this place, we cannot, we cannot cause spiritual change in anybody. Only the power of the Holy Spirit does that. Now, the Holy Spirit uses you and I to be a catalyst to do that. But it's not me and you that does it. So quit thinking it's you and quit worrying about, well, what if, what if? Because it's all God. God just says, speak it. Just do it and let me worry with it. You know? Just do it and let me, let me worry with the details. You just say, hey, Jesus loves you. Third thing, Henry Black, spiritual leaders are accountable to God. Now, I believe this. I believe this strongly, but I'm also going to say this. I know pastors who will say, "Well, I'm accountable to God. I don't need any human accountability." That is a lie. That is a straight up lie, folks. I need accountability every single day. And God has blessed us. We've prayed and prayed and prayed with a staff and a group of elders who hold me accountable, who are my wise counsel, and who and, and no, I did not put people around me who are going to say everything I want to hear. I put people in place. God put people in place because they were prayed over. Every single chair around that table was prayed for. God put who He wanted there. Because... I see things one way. I have one kind of temperament. Elder or staff member has another kind of temperament. And they may say, hey, you need to think about this. Have you thought about this? I wouldn't be, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do right now. Okay? We need accountability. Okay? We've got to have that accountability. And here's the thing. Just like a teacher has not taught until a student has learned, we as pastors can never blame our constituents for our mistakes. If you don't get it, it ain't your fault, it's my fault. I can't blame you when, when you don't do what you're supposed to do if I haven't taught you. I've got to accept responsibility for that. And listen, I said this earlier. Leaders do not make excuses. If, if you have a leader and, and, you know, and they miss the spiritual ball and they come up and say, sun was in my eyes, tripped on a rock, and had a hole in the glove. I'd go somewhere else. Because all that person doing is making excuses. Guys, we as leaders, we as people need to stop making excuses and start making history in your family life. You realize you could be the one God put there to break the cycle of everything that's happened in your family life forever? Right. Guys, we need to take responsibility. We need to step up, step up and accept that responsibility. You, you do know that Eisenhower, the, the night before D-Day, June 6, 1944. Well, it was actually June 3, 1944, because you may not know this, D-Day was supposed to be June 5th, and the weather held it up, kind of like it is outside. Okay. Dwight David Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of Allied Forces, wrote a letter to be delivered to the President, to Winston Churchill, and all the other Allied Forces commanders accepting full responsibility and claiming full responsibility for the failure of D-Day if, if it had failed. That's a leader, folks. 
Yeah. Most of us say, well, it was that silly lieutenant over there. If he'd have been doing what I told him to do, then it wouldn't have failed. No. The buck stops with us as leaders. Okay, the buck stops with us. Fourth thing, Blackaby says, spiritual leaders can influence everybody, not just God's people. Listen, God didn't call you just to influence His people. He called you to influence the world. He said, I want you to be light in a dark world. I want you to be hope in a hopeless world. Okay? I love this statement. God's agenda applies as much to the marketplace as it does to the meeting place. So what does that tell all of us who work in the marketplace? We are ministers. We are marching in God's army. We are the ministers. Wherever you serve, wherever that is. Fifth thing, most important. Spiritual leaders work from God's agenda. This is the hardest thing for a pastor, for anybody to do. Most of the time, here's what most of the time we do. We come up with these great ideas. We come up with all these supervisions. We do all this stuff. And then we say, God, here's what I'm going to do now. Why don't you get on board and bless it? God, we're going to take these people and put them $4 million in debt. And I want you to bless it. God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to back you in the corner. And now you bless it. Guys, we don't need to ask God to bless what we're doing. We need to ask God to give us the courage to do what He's blessing. God's called us to be the run, the sent leader, the spiritual leader, and then finally the servant leader. You're to be the shepherd. You're to lead a flock. You're to feed that flock. You're to serve that flock like God has called you. And this is this is one of the coolest things I think in, in studying the word pictures behind all this. That word for shepherd is the exact same word that in other places in the in the Bible is is used for under rower. Okay, under rower. And the under rower is it refers to those slaves down in the very belly of a Greek ship that are chained to the oars that are just rowing to move the ship. That's the spirit of the pastor. Okay. We take our place as the under rower in God's kingdom. Ron, our place is not on the deck barking out orders to everybody. Our place is in the bottom of the ship, chained to the oars, <coughs> rowing with all our might with the servant's heart. Jesus is the master and the commander of the ship. We are the slaves. And I think it's important to understand that those slaves in the under rower, they were actually chained to those oars. We are chained to Christ. We are, chained. we are no longer chained to sin. We are no longer chained to our past, our failures. No. We are chained to Christ. We exist for the Master. We cannot, we do not serve anybody or anything else. And then one last thing I lied to you. There's one last thing. Ron, you called me the speaking pastor. Okay. You've already done a great job serving us, filling in. As an ordained minister, God has <coughs> called you to study and teach God's Word. And here's the thing. You don't add anything to it. You don't take anything from it. You don't cherry pick verses and take them out of context. You preach the whole Word of God. Guys, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of people cherry picking God's Word to make it mean what they want to mean. People take verses out of context, have no idea what the verse before it says or after it says, but they will, well, they're going to use it to drive somebody in the ground. You know? We preach the whole Word of God. And it's a sweet Word of God. Remember we talked about before how, how in, the, in the Jewish temple or in, in the, the places where the rabbis would be teaching, a lot of times they would just have one scroll and they would take that scroll from town to town, village to village, and when they would get there, that rabbi would unroll that scroll and would hold it up like this 
to show people that the actual Word of God was still there. And pe people would come up and touch it with their hands and then rub it to their mouth. Now we just throw it on the back deck of the car when we get up, you know, and it stays there until the next Sunday. Guys, we've got to preach. We preaching literally means like we like on our on our Romans sermon bumper where it talks about you know bringing the good news. That's what a preacher is. It's a herald. You're a herald. Okay, you relay the king's message loud and clear. Now, as a church, we need, to, we need to be honest here. Okay. The king's messenger was considered a very important person. Right? He was respected and, and people listened to him. He wasn't an ambassador that was supposed to be negotiating with. He was the messenger because the thing is, the message wasn't his. He spoke for the king. And listen, sometimes you may not like what the preacher's saying, but if the preacher's preaching the king's message, you've got to take that up with the king. A lot of times you'll hear me say, don't get mad at me. I didn't write it, God did. You know, talk to him about it. Okay. If, if we are in the Word like we're supposed to be, then we're going to be rightly divining that word and we're going to be learning what God's message is for the people in front of us. And it's God's message, not ours. So the pastor is called to be the sent leader, the spiritual leader, the servant leader, and the speaking leader. Here's the thing. If, if the pastor is God-anointed, God-appointed, and God-called, then we have to trust that person. We have to give oversight of the, of the spiritual body of that person. Because here's the thing, I want you to understand this. Guys, there is, a, there is a level of accountability to God that we as pastors hold that you don't hold. I'm going to be held accountable for what I have said out of my mouth to you, out of God's Word. And I steward that, I, I mean, I, I take that responsibility very, very, very highly. Very highly. Because I know I'm going to be the one to stand in front of God and give an accountability for, for how I shepherded this flock. Ezekiel 34 9 says this. This is God speaking. I will hold them responsible for what has happened to my flock. Listen. Your pastors and pastors who understand this. Guys, we're just not flippantly throwing stuff out there. We're not flippantly trying to just to, to, you know, tickle your ears. Because if we do that, we're going to be held accountable for it. We are held accountable for this time. So, Ron, as we, we turn back towards you, God is literally calling you to shepherd, to care for, to take care of people from their lives from beginning to to end. And listen, and I don't know of any other job that has this kind of thing where you, you know, you get to stand where nobody else stands. You get to go where nobody's gone before. Star Trek people. Okay? You get to be close to people. You get to be a, a, an integral part of their lives during their happiness, during their sadness during their, their grief, during their joy, during the most pivotal watershed milestone markers in a people's life, that's where pastors stand. In fact, some of the best sermons you'll ever preach, Ron, are ones you didn't even open your mouth, but just where you stood by somebody's bed. So, as we wrap up, 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4, and it says to all of us pastors, I know we've got other pastors in this room. Look what it says. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, 
Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And listen, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Guys, listen, being a pastor, and, and I'm, just, I'm just speaking honestly with you, being a pastor is the toughest thing I've ever done. But it's the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And I would never, never change it. So, all of that being said, and Ron, if you're still in this thing, <laughs> I've got to ask the church this. Church members, do you and uh, do you acknowledge and affirm Ron's calling as pastor? And will you pray for him and Sandy in their ministry? Will you support them in ministry? If so, will you show your support by standing right now? Ron, if you and Sandy would come forward. And Ron, I'm going to ask you to kneel right there. And Sandy, you stand beside him. Ron, you kneel facing the congregation. And uh, what I'd like to do right now is I would like to ask um, any ordained pastors in the congregation to come forward. Yeah, Dan, come on. Others? Ordained pastors. And what you guys are going to do is you're going to put your hands on Ron and Sandy. And then I'd like to ask anyone who's been ordained as a deacon or an elder in a church to please come forward. I know we got some of you. Come on. Put your hand on one of them. If you're, an el if you're one of our elders or one of our former elders, come on up. Come on, Dad. Who else? I, I can't see back there in the back. Okay. Great. And what we're going to do right now is let's pray. Father God, 
your word says that you set apart some people for the task of being a pastor. God, we thank you for the privilege today. We thank you for the privilege we've had of being a part of your plan in Ron and Sandy's life and seeing this actually happening in our service, this special opportunity, God. And Lord, it's so clear to those of us who've been around Ron that we know that you have called him with this purpose. He's been living this purpose out, God. He's been your pastor, your minister. We're just, we're just finally catching up with you and, and acknowledging that. So God, we appreciate and, and anticipate all the ways you're going to use Ron and Sandy to further your kingdom, God. And I ask right now, God, you'd be with Ron and Sandy all the years to come. Give him the wisdom he's going to need, the patience he's going to need, the love he's going to need to serve as a pastor. And give Sandy the, the grace and the patience and uh, the love that she will need to serve as a pastor's wife. God, thank you for calling this family, this man, to you and setting him apart even before he was born, God. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This certificate of ordination on behalf of Outright Church and uh, love you. Love you. Also, it's our privilege to get you start off right. Got you a new minister's Bible there. Teach you everything you don't know. <laughs> uh, you know way more than this. You must have thank you. God bless y'all. Thank, thank you all. Us is this. God called Ron to be a pastor. He called you to be his disciple. Wherever you are, anywhere, God has called you. Ron has answered the call. What's keeping you from answering the call to be his disciple? Guys, we put so many things in front of God's call. We move it to the back burner and feel like, well, if it's still there tomorrow, I'll deal with it. You know? Kind of like a sore, a sore throat or a toothache. But if it's still there tomorrow, I'll do something about it. You know? No. God is, listen, think about, think about how much Rock Hill and your county would be radically infected and changed if every person here today just simply accepted the call that God put on them. And quit making excuses and started making history. Because that's your, that's your call. So here's what I want to do. I want you to, uh, instead of doing our regular quiet time during this time, I've got another short video I want you to watch. And I want you to listen to the video. I want you to watch the video. And I want, I want it to challenge you. I want it to challenge you. What's it going to take for you to answer?